friend. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Parents Who Write. Today, I am joined by Megan Clancy, who is a writer of upmarket women's fiction and queer contemporary romance, a book coach, a former high school English teacher, and a mother of two young children. She loves to travel and has lived in Australia, Nepal, and now the United States. Megan, thank you so much for joining me on the show today. Thank you for having me. It's so nice to be here. Thank you for bearing with all of my technical (laughs) issues that delayed this recording. (laughs) It is okay. It happens to all of us. Right? That is the true, the true, uh, Hallmark of parenthood. Of course. Flexibility. Absolutely. So let's dive in because we have some really fun stuff to talk about today. Yes. All right. So you once said that when the pandemic hit and you gave birth to your second son, you lost yourself and your writing to the daily grind of motherhood. Yes. When and how did you realize how important writing was to your identity and mental health? <laughs> the how was probably like <laughs> absolute mental breakdown. <laughs> mm. Yeah, you, you're, it's just suddenly hit you that, oh, like this is not, I'm not where I need to be and everything is not okay. Like I keep telling myself and everyone who asks, I'm okay, I'm fine. The world is not burning around me. Um, but my second was a few months old. Uh, I had a two-year-old as well. And mm-hmm. between new parenthood and the pandemic, we were just stuck inside all day. And writing and exercise have always just been my two big forms of therapy. And exercise went out the window because who had the time <laughs> in right. early parenthood? And I used to be able to get away and go to the gym and those were all closed and um, writing again, just didn't have the time, didn't have the brain power or focus ability and your mental state just gets to a point where you can't think of anything creative. And so that all went away and it took a while um, for me to realize how bad it had gotten and how much I really like, I was like, oh, those are the band-aids that I need to survive this period of life. So yeah, yeah. realize that need to get that back somehow. Yeah. I uh I suddenly became an at-home parent after having my second child because the daycare that my first had been at throughout his first two and a half years of life, and I trusted these people 100 uh, percent it was an in-home daycare. And I kid you not, one week before I was supposed to go back to work after having my second, the owner of the daycare was like, nah, I'm done with this. I want my house back. Oh, yeah. And uh, so I broke out in hives yep. and had panic attack. And now I have a three-month-old. And finding a place for my two-and-a-half-year-old was not so much a trial, but it was most definitely for a, a newborn. Right. So I became an at-home parent and um, yeah, it wasn't during a pandemic, but suddenly being at home with these two people who were 100% dependent on me for everything Mm -hmm. was very overwhelming. And yeah, I I didn't make time for writing. I didn't even know how to prioritize time for myself during that period. Um, And it doesn't help that prioritizing yourself is not something that people encourage you to do as a mother. They don't. They don't. And they don't give you lessons about this or even warnings. Yeah. That's the other part is when you're dealing with, even if you have, like, if you have women around you that are going through this at the same time, great, fantastic, you lean on each other, but it's kind of the blind leading the blind, right? Mm -hmm. And anyone that's had kids in that past, they've gotten to a point where, like, you talk to your own mother or older women that are like, they don't remember the bad parts. (laughs) They don't. Remember what it was like on a daily basis. And I got to the point where I was like, I am not taking parenting advice from anyone who did not do this during a pandemic because everything that worked for you isn't working right now. I don't have those outlets. So who yeah. who do I turn to? And yeah, yeah, I really, I love that there is this new wave of mothers coming through that are like, no, in order to be a full and complete and good mother, I have to focus on myself 
and I have to do stuff for myself. But there's still a very strong um, societal belief that mothers are supposed to be sacrifice everything for the good of your child and you end up sacrificing yourself and that's not okay. It's not. And then our kids don't get the best version of us. When I put my kids first for everything, I was depleted Mm -hmm. all the time. And they just got an exhausted, irritated, bitter, Mm -hmm. cranky mom. Like, that's not what I wanted to give them either. So um, I agree. It's been a relief to hear more and more parents come forward and say, Dude, you have to make time for yourself in order to give your kids a better version of you. Like, it's not, yes, you need it for you, but your kids also need it. Yeah. And we make these, you know, we have these jokes about, like, mommy wine culture and mommy's taking her happy pills and everyone has the thing that they need to, like, survive. And I think, wouldn't it be fantastic if instead of depending on these band-aids, or even making fun of these band-aids, let's address the like underlying issue and figure out how do we support these women. So mommy wine culture isn't the joke with this really dark subtext. Um, wouldn't be necessary. And I'll always like have my glass of wine for fun and enjoy, but it's not gonna be like the, the joke of mommy needs her wine because she needs to just take a break for a second. Uh huh. Yeah. I hear you. I completely agree. So, how did you change your mindset so that you could prioritize writing among the hundreds of other daily tasks that could consume your day? Right. Um. It got to a point where it's like, like you said, I I realized I needed to make this a, an intentional decision, and I had to figure out a way to make it a priority. And for me, like. Looking through the day, obviously, there was at the time there was no daycare. The playgrounds were closed. There wasn't going to be a time. And my two year old had decided that naps were no longer a thing. Um, oh. Both my children now believe that naps are not a thing. Uh, so <laughs> I don't get nap time. So I knew that during during the children's waking hours, there was mm-hmm. probably not going to be much writing time. Um, yeah. I can sneak in a few minutes here or there, but like for a, just a focus just me focus on it. I, I'm not gonna have anyone asking for snacks I'm not gonna have anyone asking for it had to be outside of their waking hours and I've always been more of a morning person so you know wake up an hour earlier and yes there may be days when it makes me more tired but if I get in that hour or so of writing before everything mentally I'm in such a better place like I have yeah I've done this bit for my creative process, for my creative mm-hmm. growth, for my personal, emotional well-being. I've gotten it out of the way. So regardless of what else goes wrong during the day, and as a mother, you are well aware, everything can go wrong during the day. And oh, yes. I don't want to leave it to where after 8 p.m. I can finally write because I'm going to be too tired, regardless of when I woke up in the morning. <laughs> So having that early morning and the intention behind what I'm writing, it mm-hmm. definitely makes the me space. And it makes me, like you said, it makes me a better more, uh, better mom for my kids throughout the day because I don't have this in the back of my head of like, I wish I could be doing this now. No, I yeah. did that. I had that part of my day. This is a different part of my day. I love how different parents can find different ways to make it happen because I'm a night owl. Mm. And I went through years where I was too exhausted and mentally tapped out at the end of the day to write. And so I didn't write for several years. But what became a big change for me was the more, I don't know why I laughed before I say this, but the more, the more depressed I got, it sounds so sad, um, the more I daydreamed. And then it got to the point where I gave myself permission to write. And especially for a first, for that shitty first draft to just tell the story. And I had daydreamed the story to the point that when I was ready to sit down at night, I was ready to go. Exactly. And the words just flew out at that point. So that was the big shift for me. Mm -hmm. And then also, like you said, one of the other biggest differences for me was realizing that I I couldn't write for hours and hours like I used to. Mm -hmm. So I got really good at 
I've got the idea now. I've daydreamed it. I've got the key few sentences. Great. Let me open up my phone real quick, record those thoughts, and then I'm ready to go tonight when I'm ready to start writing. So that was another thing that was a big shift of I don't have to write for hours. I can sneak in 10 minutes here, 10 minutes there, or, you know, five minutes on the potty. Awesome. Get another thought in. The the number of times that I've thought to myself, how did moms, whether you work, you know, creatively or not, how did you get work done before your cell phones? Because I've, yeah, the notes on the toilet or notes yep. while I'm sitting in the carpool liner or whatever. And this is like, it yep. does, my writing has changed or my writing time and the the chunks of time that I get change as the boys get older. And I know other yep. women, like as your kids get older, okay, so I have three mornings a week now where they're at preschool and I can write a bit during that time um Mm -hmm. i'll leave the house the problem is for me sitting at home um i start to think of all the other things that need to the laundry and everything that else that needs to be done at home so i always make sure i leave that i can get to their school a half hour to an hour before they have to get picked up so i'm stuck in my car and that's writing Mm. time and i know you know moms that like oh now my kids play sports i go and i sit at their practice and i write so as your kids change, I'm sure the writing schedule and timing changes. And for me also, yeah. like you were saying with the notes app and all that kind of stuff, I'm never not writing. I may not be at a computer physically writing, but like the story is always percolating in my head or going. So like lines of dialogue, plot points, mm-hmm. all these kind of stuff, always notes on the phone. I've dictated yep. things into my phone. It's It gets a little crazy when you like, dictate all these random thoughts and then you go and you look at it later that night you're like what did I I don't remember what I meant (laughs) I love when that happens yes I somebody asked me the other day in my Facebook group how do you hold on to an idea because they're like I had this idea and then by the time I was able to sit down and write it it was just completely gone And it's I play the scene over and over in my Mm -hmm. head and I hold on to whatever the key moment was that was like the catalyst for that scene. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, if I can remember those two sentences, Mm -hmm. that that's what I need. And then the rest of it will come back to me if I can just hold on to whatever that key catalyst was. Sometimes I like repeat, repeat, repeat. Yeah. Oh, and speaking it, like making Mm -hmm. it so it's audio and mental. So like the number of times that. I've gone through an entire shower saying a line of dialogue over and over. Yes. <laughs> yes. Out loud. I'm sure people thought I was crazy. Yep. Yeah. And then never, never in bed, like right as you're about to sleep. Oh, I remember it in the morning. No. no. Nope. Mm-hmm. Write it down first. Yep. Just those few sentences. It'll trigger the thought yep. in the morning. Yep. How many times when I'm doing the dishes and I'm talking out loud dialogue, mm. as my husband comes in and he's like, oh, new scene for your book? Yes, I am. Mm-hmm. Please leave. I'm in the middle of my thoughts. <laughs> like, okay. Like, they know. It's fine. Yeah. Um, so how did you get your family on board? What boundaries did you set? Um, a door. That's, <laughs> that's kind of the big necessary thing. And I, I talk to people about this and I know that I am, um, I'm blessed enough to have a space where I can close a door. I know plenty of mm. parent writers who, you know, you have to sit there and write. You don't have the door and the kids see you. And mm. it almost works. I, when I'm typing stuff on my phone, my, my kids don't relate that to work. If they see the computer and they see me typing, they... <clears throat> I mean, they're two and four, so still, like, it's very, <laughs> their world yes. is the point. But um, mm-hmm. I can say, you know, give me one minute. I just got to finish typing this or whatever. For mm-hmm. me, like I was talking about, you're always writing in your head. Mm-hmm. What a lot of non-writers don't understand is me sitting, staring off in the corner. I'm I'm working. Like, I ha- mm-hmm. I'm trying to process this thing in my head. So without the door, it's very easy for people to walk in, see you just staring at a wall, and think you can be interrupted. Um, so yeah, the door and that morning time, like, fortunately I have a very supportive partner and he, you know, until a certain hour in the morning that we've agreed upon, like if the boys mm-hmm. get up and thankfully they've started sleeping a bit longer. Um, oh, I know that's nice. fantastic. So nice. <laughs> because nice. it used to be like, that was 
that broke my train of thought, right? Like if, if I'm working here writing and pitter patter across the, I hear them upstairs. Oh, freaking mom guilt, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> yes. You start to think, oh, they're up. And even if I'm like, okay, she's taking care of them. I can sit here and write, but my mind already starts thinking about what, what's going to be for breakfast. When do we have to leave um, doing the backward math mm-hmm. of everything that has to happen today? <laughs> Yep. And so, yeah, it's it's the separation and understanding of and having someone to support you in your journey. Yeah. I know far too many, especially mom writers who like don't take themselves seriously or aren't in a in a situation where whoever is their support person doesn't take their their writing seriously. It's a hobby or it's just for fun or oh. whatever. I yeah. I've worked with mom writers who their own partner doesn't know that they're trying to write just because either they don't feel like they would be supported or they're not confident enough in saying like I am a writer. And that's mm-hmm. another thing like making that statement to yourself and to everyone around you puts significance on it and that sets up a good boundary of like this is my thing this is what I'm doing. Yep. Yeah. I am a writer. I encourage everybody to own that statement because it really does make a difference. Absolutely. And and not um, a um oh what is everyone right? I am a not like future writer. What is the um, Oh, like, like the mugs future author. Well, the future, future author that's fine, or... but it's too many people put in there I'm a um aspiring writer. Oh, well, yes. Nope. Aspiring writer. No, you are a writer. If you're, if you're writing, you're a writer. Like, how, how are you yeah. an aspiring writer? An aspiring writer is someone that, like, maybe one day I'll write something. Is that, right. is that what that is? Like, I guess. No, you're not an aspiring right? writer. You might be an aspiring published author. That's different. Yes. That but is different. You're not an aspiring writer. You're a writer. Take, like, yes. claim it, give it intention and purpose in your life and carry forth. Yep. That was one of my favorite transformations to watch with my clients, too, where, like, one who started with me, she was like, I just want to journal every day. That's it. That's my goal, to make this time for myself. And uh, by the time she was done, she was 10 chapters into her first novel. There you go. So it's, and it just took that, like, even just the first month of, no, you're already a writer. Mm -hmm. We're going to prioritize this for you. And she did. And she was like, yes, this makes a difference. I'm not yelling at my kids as much. And like, I know. And that's exactly why your partner should support that with you because everybody's benefiting from your writing. Yeah. So, yeah. Pouring into your own cup. Before you yes. have to pour all those thousands of milk cups a day. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, so. I'm envious of your door. <laughs> I am the mom who writes in the living room. And for a long time, it was the corner of the sofa. Mm -hmm. There's a particular corner of the sofa that once my butt was in that seat Mm -hmm. and I had the laptop on my lap, that meant mom was writing. And my Mm -hmm. kids learned to see that visually. So at least I had that. But then I graduated to getting a desk in the living room because Mm -hmm. I just don't have a dedicated room right now. But... My preschooler is in pre-K in the mornings now for three hours. And so that's when I do. Yeah, I know, right? Um, this September, he's starting kindergarten. And I'm, I'm equally heartbroken and equally elated. <laughs> so, well, he's my last baby. So there's that bittersweet moment. Yes. But yeah. No, my so, children, if, they, if I sit on a couch, mommy transforms into a jungle gym. So, oh. um, no, there is no sitting on the couch with a computer. Um, I do throw on Bluey, which is. Fantastic. Oh, heck yeah. And um, the island in the kitchen is my desk. And I sit there and, and type uh-huh. while standing up at the kitchen. Because, yeah, if anyone sits in this household, you are climbing equipment. I love yeah. it. He has, my preschooler has climbed on the back of my chair and then onto my shoulders mm-hmm. while I'm typing at my desk. Um, and I'm like, this is cool. Mm-hmm. And he'll play with my hair. And then I just keep typing. And I'm like, we're good. Yeah. So, and then he'll be like, mommy, I've had enough now. I want to play with you. And I'm like, okay, bud, let me finish this thought. Let's go play. But 
he's content for a while for right. me to finish my thoughts for at least 10 minutes while he plays with my hair and sits on my shoulders. Yeah. But um, my phone showed me a memory the other day of when I had my first and he was like brand newborn and I was sitting typing and it was one of those like he was in that phase where he needed something he didn't ever like a pacifier but my finger in his mouth was oh. fine and so mm-hmm. my fingers are on the keyboard and this pinky is sticking in his mouth and he's laying next to the computer and I was like I miss those days wow <laughs> when it was so impressive. easy to write and keep them quiet at the same time <laughs> yes I have I came across a photo of my then two and a half year old watching TV and I had the baby asleep on my chest mm. and I had the laptop on my lap and I was writing. When they couldn't yep. move, wasn't it nice? Yes. It was nice when they couldn't move. Yeah. So you shared with me that motherhood can make it feel like writing dreams are unachievable and even inappropriate. Oh, it hurts, but I, I, I know how true that is. I've heard other people say that. So can you talk to us about that more? Yeah, it's kind of what we were saying before about so much of the message from society and culture and everything. And I know this is an, a very Americanized um, idea, but that like you should be devoted to your children. There, sh- you could have no personal life, no every anything. Like oh. you are a bad mother if you are not devoting every minute of your day to your children. And I counter that with, no, them seeing me work hard towards something that I really want and have a passion, I don't think I could set a better example for them. And I agree. So I don't want to just keep my writing to secluded moments when they're not awake. I make sure that they see, you know, we we talk about mommy's going to write right now and mommy has to do some work for writing. Um. Yeah, showing that example of, no, there's something that mommy loves to do and she's putting a lot of effort into it and working hard to achieve certain things that she wants to achieve. Like, why would you not want to display that for your kids? Mm. (laughs) But yes, there is a strong message that, you know, mothers should wait till the kids are out of the house or, you know, I want to write a book, but I'll do it when I have time. No, do it now. Do it now. Yeah. Life's too short. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how do you help other parents to overcome that line of thinking? How do you help encourage them to get past that? Mm. Aside from just think about the role model that you right. want to be for them. Do you have any other advice to help them get past the the guilt mm. trap? <laughs> yeah. Um, and I'm, I mean, any mom who says she doesn't have mom guilt where she's writing or doesn't have writer's guilt while she's momming, I question because it's always going to be there. Um, there's always going to be the doubt either way. But for me and what I encourage my clients to do on one of the first things that we talk about is what is your intention? Not specific, not just for writing in general, which you should have an intentionality behind why you're a writer and what you want to bring to your work. But mm-hmm. placing an intention on the specific story that you're working on now gives it that importance right it's something that has to be done and this is the reason i'm writing this because x y and z Mm -hmm. or and giving it that point and that intention makes it easier to be like no no honey (laughs) i need a break from lego (laughs) yes because i have to go write this like this is this is something important it's something that has to get done and i am by no means someone that says you have to write every day because it's just not feasible a lot of times it's not going to happen. But having that intentionality and that point to what you were writing specifically, this one story, um, makes it so it can't be something that's just constantly pushed down the list. It's one of your three main things that has to get done today. You're speaking to my heart here. (laughs) (laughs) One of the things that my previous mentor talked to us about was our big why, which is that same idea of your intention, right? Yes. And she got us to acknowledge what becomes possible, not only for ourselves, but also for our families and also for our future readers yeah. if we sit down and make this happen now. And that was very eye-opening because starting with me, it was, oh, well, I'm happy, right? Or I'm happier. And then it benefits my family because they get a happier parent. 
hopefully if I get to the point where I can actually earn income from my writing, then there's also that benefit for the family. And then uh, whatever specific story it is that I'm writing, I like to think about how that is going to help my readers. Absolutely. That they've been, especially for the readers who have been waiting for that story. Right. Whatever the story is in your head, you are making it because it hasn't been made yet. And someone else wants it just as much as you do. I see it kind of two sides of it is that you have readers out there that can connect with something that you're writing and they need that. And there are other mother writers out there that need that person that's writing this story to be like, oh, I can can do it too, right? Like it's yes, everything that you're writing, someone else is going to connect with and every part of your journey, someone else is going to connect with. And yeah. I think a lot of what I write is, you know, like I said, it's part of my therapy. It's part of understanding who I am. The story that I'm writing right now is very much tied to my personal journey. And so it's like I'm writing this not only for me, but this is something that I know other women are going through and other people. I mean, if this book was out there before, it would have been very helpful for me. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, that's definitely seeing that. And I don't want like. If I sat down every morning and were like, I have to write this book because the weight of the world is on me. That's too much. Oh, right. <laughs> that's too no, much. No, 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 thank you. No. And that's, that's pretty huge thinking on my part. Like, please. Right. <laughs> get over yourself. Right. And just get yeah. the words on the paper. <laughs> yes. And who cares about the showing and the telling right now? No. Just get the story down. Scoop that sand in the sandbox. We'll work on the castles later. Oh, yes. Oh, I love that. That's such a fantastic description of that. So what advice do you have to offer other parents who write so that they can find confidence with their own ideas and their works in progress? Um, <laughs> confidence is like just, yeah, it's, it's the not thinking of the, the whole. Think of the next steps that you have to take. We're going up this staircase. It's one thing mm-hmm. at a time. Um, everyone started somewhere, right? Everyone, you always hear about like every draft is a shitty first draft. I would love to oh, like yeah. some of these big authors. It would be really nice if they like give us a sample of what the first draft was of your book. Because yes. I know they having that, that's where the confidence comes from is stop comparing yourself across the board. Mm-hmm. And that goes for writing and momming. Like motherhood yeah. is about constant comparison right and you're constantly told you're not good enough because someone else is doing something better um just stop comparing it's your journey um don't worry that someone else got their book written in five months and you're taking five years it does not matter the books will get out there in the episode that i recorded with hl brooks mm-hmm. she said to stop comparing yourself to other writers because that's basically an imposter syndrome injection. Absolutely. And I was like, I love that. That's true. Yeah. Like, all I keep picturing now are these like instant injections of imposter syndrome because we keep comparing ourselves. Yeah. So I I agree 100% with that. And I've caught myself before. Like my writing group, we joke about when we all read like a really, really good book. And it's like, well, should we just like give up now? Like this is, there's no way that we're ever writing like this, right? Like we should just stop right. writing. <laughs> but that's not the point, right? You're not writing to equal someone else in their style. You're writing mm-hmm. to create your own thing. And yeah, imposter syndrome is, is it's a strong force in the creative field. And it's it is. separating yourself, um, especially once you get further down the line and you've started like querying books and some you have a, like a whole desk drawer of manuscripts that have been put on the back burner for a while. Um, yeah. You got to separate the business from the writing because the rejection is constant. And it took me a while to get the thick skin of like, nope, next thing, moving on. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. Um, There was somebody in my group who had recently posted a question of, oh, I started this idea for this story. Can somebody let me know if this is like worth even continuing? And I replied... I don't remember 100% what I said, but I was like, how could we possibly know if your story is worth telling yet? Because you haven't told it. 
you don't know what you're going to discover the more you write and develop this idea. You don't know what it's going to turn into. You don't know what nuggets of gold you're Absolutely. going to discover or dig up or whatever the analogy is with right. gold. Um, but Mine out of that mountain. And you're never going right? to like whatever your story idea is at the start. What you yeah. end up with at the end might not include that original idea yeah. at all. Exactly. Like part of it is, especially with the shitty first draft, is that discovery of what you're going to tell. So I was like, please don't judge that yet, friend. Just yeah. keep writing it. And, you know, then when you're done with your shitty first draft, then you can look <laughs> back and be like, OK, where are my plot holes? Mm -hmm. And what characters did it turn out that I didn't need? And, you know, what what character arc is it that I'm trying to tell here? What transformation is it that I want at the end? What message right. am I trying to convey? Right. Like you don't you don't know that yet. And so it's like, don't stop writing it. And well, no. who am I to judge your story idea right now? Like that's keep going. That is a writer that needs and we all do. We want that mm -hmm. validation. Right. Like I'm I'm. Yeah. This is a good story. I should write it. And I would say, yes, start writing any any story and you're going to get 20,000 words in and realize, nope, don't want to write that one. I have this other story in my head. And that's a problem when it happens over and over again, when you reach a certain mark and you're like, I'm going to let my brain focus on something else for a while. Um, mm -hmm. But you got to just try, like get get those, get to 20,000 words and see if you're like, no, this isn't it. And that sounds like a lot of work and it is, but you got to try all the openings before you can get in the right house. Or... Yeah, exactly. And you don't know which one's going to pan out you don't know which one's going to surprise you yet so and like okay. you write those twenty thousand words and you don't like them right now don't throw them away right 10 years down the road maybe you realize what was wrong with it and it clicks back in but yep you gotta and try. it's still practice absolutely it's, it's still all practice you're still learning your craft so it's never a waste of time that's for sure so um so what are you currently working on? I am currently working on, um, it's an upmarket women's fiction with uh, a sapphic love story undertone. Yes. Cool. Loving it. It's um, It's been a lot of fun. A lot of, like I talked about, self-discovery kind of stuff working, working its way through there. Um, but a lot of it, it's, it's all based on the idea of, you know, what if you got to live out the what ifs? What if you were able to go back and change things would you want to um, and would you want to return to the same place you are mm, that's interesting yeah. there was um i can't remember the author's name and i always feel so bad about that but the name of the book is oranges are not the only forbidden fruit and i distinctly remember this moment in the book where the main character is thinking about all the what ifs mm. and that every time you make a decision, there's another parallel world that shoots off where you get to live out that opposite mm -hmm. decision. And that always stayed with me wondering what would have happened if I had made these different decisions. Yeah. For example, a big one that I always think about is I got into Kent University for my master's in writing in England. Mm -hmm. And I chose not to go. I instead got my master's at Hopkins in D.C., which is where I met my husband, who is the love of my life. So, of course, I have zero regrets about that right. because I am madly in love with my husband. Right. No question. But there's that curiosity of what would it have been like to have studied abroad in England yep learning more about the craft of writing and literature and et cetera, and just that experience. So, yeah. Yeah. And there's, it's the whole like sliding doors, right? Like what if you make mm -hmm. the train? What if you miss the train? How different does life become? And yeah, this one's yeah. more, uh, yeah. what if you were still with that person? The different people that you're with throughout your life, what happens mm -hmm. is at this point in your life, you're still with that person and yeah. exploring all those avenues. So, yeah. It's interesting. That's really interesting. So that brings us to my last question, which is what are some of your favorite books and your kids' books and why? Can I just show you my book? 
bookshelf. That's <laughs> I know, um, right? Like mine's behind me. Uh, or right. You don't even see the full. Yeah. So I picked like three of my most recent favorites. I think that's how I'm going to. Okay. Yeah. Uh, there you go. Okay. My favorite of last year was The No Show by Beth O'Leary. I don't know it. It is so, what's it about? so good. The tagline is three women, three dates, one missing man. So it's this one guy and there's three different women. But there is this twist. So I initially listened to it, which as a mother audiobooks, fantastic. Um, <laughs> and there's a twist. And when the twist happened, I was like, wait, what? And I had to like go back and rewind, I guess you would call it. I listened mm-hmm. to it again. And I was like, no, I have to get the the printed copy and like go through and see how she her storytelling and the way she worked things oh masterful and because then you didn't see it coming but then when you go back you can realize how many breadcrumbs there were that's why as a as a writer yeah. i'm like no i want to see how how did she yeah this work so well uh um, that's amazing i love that one of my favorites from this year so far is lessons in chemistry mm. fantastic um you know fight the patriarchy women in science but in like the 50s fantastic Ooh. so so as a craft side of things so mm-hmm. much head hopping but it works and i was like how oh, really? how is this working but it worked like uh-huh. head hopping within one scene between the woman the man and the dog like you get in the dog's head and it's but it's a it's it. a brilliant story and the voice is masterful and then so fiction or non-fiction these, these are all fiction okay so i wanted to verify yes, fiction the, yeah and then the other um, most recent love is uh, Delilah Green Doesn't Care. I don't um, know. What's that one about? Ashley Herring Blake. She has, this is the first in her trilogy. Her third in her trilogy is coming out this year, which I'm super excited about. Sassic mm. um, romance in this okay. small little town up in the Pacific Northwest. And just, yeah, all about, you know, it's a... At the heart of it, it's it's a female women's group of friends story, and just like how you survive as a female in the world and traveling through it. But yeah, the the sapphic romance is just a uh, she does she writes it so well. So yeah, mm. Ashley Herring Blake, I will read anything by her. Nice. Um, with the kids' books, when I speak of audio books, are thing is listening to a book in my car and my boys are both obsessed with uh, the magic tree house which is super old like i remember reading it but they love it my four-year-old talks about jack and annie like they're his friends at school you know that didn't occur to me of that as an audiobook we've been listening to dragon masters on audiobooks Mm -hmm. and my seven-year-old loves them my four-year-old is bored out of his mind like mama what are you doing to me so, but Magic Treehouse Magic might actually be a good balance between the two of them. And yeah, that one didn't occur to me as an audiobook. The last, like, they're so obsessed with it. And my four-year-old is constantly like, can we, can we download the next one? Can we download the next one? Yeah. And then for physical books, Little Blue Trucks is the two-year-old. Oh. Like, beep, beep, quack, quack. He's all about it. And then my four-year-old loves the, um, this is the, I built a house. This is the first one, I think. But Chris Van Dunsen does i built a house i built a car and i built a school and it's just so imaginative and the it's Ooh. very it's rhymy and the, the lines will stick in your head but the illustrations Ooh. are great they're very um like retro Ooh. i don't yeah. know these ones yeah they're good i know a little blue truck but i didn't know about the i built a house i built a so house it's you. very i recommend for it like yeah the, the lines Has will get stuck in your head, but they're so much fun. It's Jack is this kid who has a great imagination. And it's like, what would I put in a house? I put a room with no gravity and I would put an art room where there's like this giant piece of paper that you can just draw all over the wall and then rip it off and you're done. Mm. It's, it's a good one. A book that I have been reading to my kids and it makes me tear up and like cry by the time I get to the end of it's absolutely beautiful, and it's called Maybe. Read and it. I, yes. you've read it, Lots yes. And especially at the end about the idea about when pigs can fly, mm-hmm. and at the end she has the pig flying, mm-hmm. and I just I cry because I feel like that book is so applicable to every single human being on this planet. Mm-hmm. 
that maybe you haven't discovered your right. purpose yet. And maybe the world has been waiting for someone just like you. And maybe you have these skills and talents that you yes. haven't even scratched the surface of yet. It's just so inspiring. Well, if you want a good cry, have you <laughs> have you read Remember Balloons? No. Remember Balloons? I cannot get through that one without. Really? It's just like all your memories are balloons that you're carrying with you. And it's a little, I think it's a little boy and his grandpa and grandpa starts losing his balloons. Oh. Oh, no. <laughs> can't, oh, can't my, do and it. this is a kid's book. Yeah. This is a kid's book. It's oh. great. I, yeah. I think I tear up more at some of these kids' books than, <laughs> than adult right? writing. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. I, I love there's it. some quote, I don't even remember who says it, but it's like, if, if you're if you want to write a story but you think it's too hard for adults to get, write it for kids. <laughs> uh, that's awesome. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Um, and the other book I was going to mention was oh, can I remember it? Oh, you were talking about sapphic romance. Mm -hmm. And one of my classmates from Hopkins she has published several sapphic romances and I'm just watching her grow and grow in her career it's been so amazing Kelly Ann Jacobson and she just released her newest book uh, I can't remember which one is the newest but I I believe her newest one is Robin and her misfits so it's a like retelling of and Robin and his merry men uh -huh, but Robin and her misfits and she did also recently another one, a retelling of Peter Pan, and it's Tinkerbell and Wendy. Ooh. Mm hmm I'm just so proud of her watching yeah. her career grow. So Some of these I really new retellings wanted... coming out are amazing. I yeah. love them. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't gotten Tinkerbell and Wendy yet, but I have to because I'm just I such an interesting it. new idea yeah. for that storyline that's never been done before. So go, Kelly. Right. We need more more queer books out there in the world, please. I agree. I agree. Well, thank you so much for joining me on the show today. Before we go, do you have anything else that you would like to share? Your contact information is all in the show notes. Yeah. So MeganAClancy.com. Um, I have both my coaching and my author stuff up there. So yeah, reach out to me if you're a mom who wants to write a book. Let's work together. It's, I am happy to help any way I can. That's fantastic. I love that you are helping more parents pursue their writing dreams. I feel like so. moms particularly have a lot to say and very little time to say it. So let's make it loud. <laughs> yes, I agree wholeheartedly. <laughs> Okay. Well, again, thank you so much for joining thank me. Thank you for having me. It's great talking to you.